Welcome to another episode of Dr. Doctor, the award-winning radio show and podcast featuring your physician host, Dr. Tom McGovern. And Dr. Andrew Mullally, where we and our guests discuss relevant and health-related topics from an authentically Catholic perspective. Dr. Doctor is brought to you in part by our friends at CMF Curo. Learn more at mycatholichealthcare.org. Live your Catholic faith in your health care with CMF Curo. Today, our guest will be heard across the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Joining us again will be Dr. Mary Keen Kirkhoff, who will inform us about children with cerebral palsy and what can be done to help them. Uh, Andrew, you see patients with CP much more often than I do because of your practice uh, in family medicine. What makes this topic important for our listeners? I, I think cerebral palsy is very important because it's frequently misunderstood, and I think it's a lot more common than many people realize. Uh, frequently, at least stereotypically, when people hear the term cerebral palsy, I think many people conjure up images of a patient in a wheelchair with very limited, uh, maybe even intellectual capacity as well, and just a severely debilitated patient. Uh, in practice, I, I see such a wide variety of patients with cerebral palsy. Oh. And so that's that's one of the things that I'd, I'd emphasize is that the most patients would not fit that stereotype, at least the ones I've met. Um, secondarily, I think many people underestimate how common it is. It's something that uh, many people might not even recognize that they know someone with cerebral palsy. And they said, oh, I never could put a name to that per se, but it is an extremely common condition because it can be caused by many different things, which I'm sure Mary's going to help enlighten us about that during the, the episode. I'm sure she will. So how common is it? I mean, do you see a patient with CP every day, every week, every month? Definitely every week, I'd say. And um, I guess I don't have the exact statistics at my fingertips for how frequent it is. I, I know we have some of that in the show show notes for Mary, but the, the thing that I would highlight is that many people with CP do not have necessarily big, profound deficits that you would readily identify if you met them on the street. But commonly, it can be things that are even more subtle, but so important to identify, especially in, in primary care where I work. The earlier you can identify it, the more benefit the patient can obtain from treatment. And so that's one of my passions related to CP. So when CP patient comes in, are they most often coming in because of their CP or they just have it incidentally and they're coming in for something else? Man, that's great. Yeah, I, at least what I see, it's usually identified at a wellness exam, uh, specifically well child checks because we, we get to see a lot of pediatric patients and it can be identified usually uh, in childhood being present from birth. Um, but I, I would say many people don't don't really have a name for it. They just say, what's going on here? What do we need to do different? And what are the parents usually noticing when they come to your office? W one of the biggest hmm. questions we get is delayed uh, motor milestones. So people are familiar with the pediatric milestones. I Which think we covered in the people, last episode with Mary. <laughs> we did. We did. And and uh, there's definitely some, some <clears throat> overlap there. But if anything, to highlight the importance of those wellness exams, many people will, will tell me, you know, every time I come in, everything's normal. What the heck? Why am I still coming in for these? Is this just <clears throat> a big gimmick? Uh, and the answer is no. We always hope that it's all normal. But there are many things like this that you would not necessarily identify when your sample size is one. Uh, I've, I've got seven little kids, and they all have their own little curveballs and quirks. <laughs> and if you take them individually, uh, it's easy to say, well, this is their weird little thing. And this one, you know, that's a cute little thing, but kind of odd. Um, when your sample size is bigger, you can look at a, a patient and say, no, this is outside of the normal range, and they'd benefit from some type of treatment. So when a patient comes in or bring when a patient is brought in for a well child check, the goal is that they find nothing and they might feel like their time is wasted. But really, that's a good thing. You don't want to have the doctor go, oh, I wonder what that is. <laughs> oh, 100 percent. Yeah. You you don't want to be the interesting patient. That's not a, a good goal to have. Right. And uh, I, I would say, you know, this would be another interesting question to ask Mary and her experience. But I would say throughout a child's life. Most often, there there are things discovered at times on the well child check exam, and they might not be serious. They might be minor, um, but there are things that patients have questions about, 
And uh, many people do have things that are slightly, slightly outside the normal range. And so talking about that and going through education and explaining it, I think it's very useful. So how many well child checks does it take on average before you find a child that has something that's not quite right? Is it every five, 10, 20, a hundred? Hmm. I guess it would, it would depend on how, how not right something is. Sure. Um, I, I would say at least every, maybe every third well child check, there is something that requires a uh, course correction. Oh, very and, good. Uh, I would say maybe even more frequently than that if we include things like pediatric obesity, which unfortunately is yes. getting to be a, a very common problem. And it's so funny because I guess funny is not the right word. It's it's kind of sad and ironic, but frequently the parents cannot identify that this child might be quite outside the normal range because for their family, you know, maybe maybe they fit right in. But so many children I see, especially related to obesity, they're kind of doomed on that path. If they've been obese since the time they're two years old, it's very hard to turn that around when you're older. And so that'd probably be the most common thing. But even other things like CP, what what we're going to be talking about today, we see the types of, of things like that very commonly. Well, it's time for the medical trivia question of the day. And of course, it's going to deal with CP in some way. And so the category I've chosen is muscle contraction. So your muscle cells contain long filaments or fibers made of two different proteins called actin and myosin. They connect and they move past each other during muscle contraction. The quiz isn't about them. But in order for these filaments to grab each other, there is a special binding site exposed that requires the presence of a certain chemical element that's on the periodic table. So what is the chemical element necessary so that these two protein filaments can connect to each other and cause muscle movement? And as a hint, I'm feeling generous today. This element is required for making the two strongest parts of the human body, being tooth enamel and bone. You're going to have to wait till the end of the show for the answer, but we'll be back after the break on Dr. Doctor with Mary King Kirchhoff and Cerebral Palsy. We are back with tonight's guest, Dr. Mary Keen Kirchhoff. She's both a pediatrician and a physiatrist. That's a specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation, where she works at Mary and Joy Rehab Hospital and Clinics in Wheaton, Illinois. She's been there for over 30 years. She was also our guest when we talked about uh, autism uh, recently. But now we're going to hit a little different topic. You know, uh, perhaps the most common neuro neurological developmental disorder that affects behavior is autism. But the most common disorder of the, the brain and nervous system affecting motor skills and muscles is cerebral palsy or it's cerebral palsy. You'll tell us which. What is cerebral palsy? And what's the right way to say it? <laughs> Either way is fine. But I usually okay. say cerebral palsy. Okay. Um, and cere cerebral palsy is a disorder of motor control that occurs to an injury or malformation of the developing brain that's often associated with other impairments, such as a sensory impairment, vision or hearing or touch, um, or learning problems or epilepsy. Um, wow. There are multiple types of cerebral palsy, um, and it is classified uh, in two major ways. One way is the parts of the body that are affected. For example, if the total body is affected, we'll call it quadriplegia or total body CP. If one side of the body is affected, we'll call it hemiplegia. If the legs are more severely involved than the arms, we call it diplegia. Sometimes there are three limbs involved and then we might call it triplegia. Wow. So where we classify CP according to the body segments that are, are affected, the other way is looking at tone. The greatest, the most common tonal abnormality is spasticity or hypertonicity, which typically affects the legs and arms. Interestingly, um, mostly there is hypotonia of the trunk, which can kind of make um, description a little more difficult. Sure. And almost every child who ends up with a diagnosis of cerebral palsy 
will have total body hypotonia at some point in time. But over the long run, um, the by far the greatest percentage of youngsters who end up with CP have the spastic type where the limbs are stiff and resist movement and have trouble with motor control, but the trunk is weak. Mary, that's a lot of medical terms. What what is that? Not not that that's wrong. It makes it it is very thorough. I I can imagine a listener saying, "What are some of the common signs that someone might have CP?" Or could you describe a, a picture for us? Sure. Um, when a youngster has um, substantial cerebral palsy, they often will even have difficulty learning to sit because the muscles that hold them up, their spinal muscles and the abdominal muscles working together are, are weak. And at the same time that they have this weakness and a, a low muscle tone posture in their trunk, if they try to move their limbs, they, the limbs will often pull in the opposite direction of what they want. And when a physician examines them, there is resistance to movement, which we call hypertonicity. And if the resistance to movement gets worse, the faster you move the muscle, we call it spasticity. Now, Mary, when I was a kid, spastic was actually used as a derogatory term referring to kids. So I didn't even know if it was correct to use the term anymore. Apparently it is. Has that stopped being used as a a term to kind of for kids to be mean at each other? Do you know? Well, uh, my suspicion is that it would still be used um, to uh, describe a youngster who has coordination difficulties or is not as good at okay. running or moving. But it has um, a specific that, meaning that means that the muscles are, are too tight. Is that an easy way to think of it? That's an easy way, but specifically, there is a velocity dependent resistance to stretch. There are many different types of muscle stiffness spasticity refers to that muscle stiffness that varies with severity depending on how fast the muscle is passively moved. Passively moved. Okay. So not trying to move their own. When you move it, the muscle resists being moved. So like if you're trying to take a a child's arm and like make a muscle with it, would that be a a typical kind of thing you would do as a pediatrician? Or even more commonly because it's most commonly, the a child with spastic cerebral palsy yes. will have their arms bent. We would try to straighten it out. And it may move very easily if we go slowly. Got it. But if we try to move it fast, there is resistance. And that resistance is spasticity. Thank you. That was helpful. Yeah, these words um, are important. <laughs> There are other types of hypertonia besides that. There's rigidity and there's dystonia, but by mo- the most common form of muscle stiffness in youngsters who have cerebral palsy is spasticity. Mary, how, how common is cerebral palsy? It has been decreasing in incidence somewhat. Wow. Um, it is now one to two per thousand, where 10 or 15 years ago, it was two to three per thousand. It varies among socioeconomic status. Um, it varies so much, uh, somewhat with race. That kind of goes along with socioeconomic status. Um, so why the good news? Why the decrease? I believe it's because of the continued improvements in neonatal intensive care. Oh, okay. So preemies are at ago, the highest risk? Yeah, for up to 50% of youngsters who are diagnosed with cerebral palsy, up to 50% have a history of being in NICU. Hmm. So that by far is the the greatest risk group, a child who has spent time in NICU. And the biggest part of those are the preterm infants. Now, but even you, among preterm infants, the incidence is going down. Awesome. Now, you talked earlier about some kind of insult to the brain or nervous system? Does it always happen before birth or can this happen after birth? It can happen after birth. For example, uh, um, well, in NICU, um, 
they typically will get an ultrasound early on and often it'll be fine. And then a week later, there's an ultrasound that, that is abnormal and shows a hemorrhage. Um, so it's a baby with, stroke or stroke in the baby. It's a, yeah, yes, that's exactly what it is. And that is happening less frequently now because we have better ventilators. When I, w- when I was a resident, we had these volume ventilators that <laughs> um, they, they, they caused more trauma than the ventilators we have now. Oh my goodness. And, and, and with resuscita- resuscitation of a baby back then, there would be, they might get a bolus and their blood pressure would go high and they have a fragile blood vessel in their brain that causes a, a hemorrhage. There's, we've got better equipment, better care, um, better recognition um, and um, treatment of their fragile vascular um, and nervous system. We're better at it. We understand it better and we've got better equipment. Well, what would be some of the most common insults that that could cause cerebral palsy besides the the ventilator? Is it all associated with prematurity or anything with like a traumatic birth? Yeah, the traumatic birth can happen, but that usually is not the cause. And birth asphyxia is relatively rare. It's less than 10% where there's actually loss of oxygen contributing to a a baby's brain injury. Um, And that can happen most likely from an abruption, for example, if the, if the placenta disattaches, you know, that what the doctor will do a C-section, get the baby out as possible, but they can't reattach the placenta once it's come off. And then Um, infections too, can they play a role? Infections definitely can play a role, play a role. And actually, a maternal infection long before delivery increases the risk of CP in a baby. Wow. So maternal inflammation, um, a urinary tract infection, for example, or a viral infection, for example, um, can set off a cascade of inflammatory responses that can affect the baby as well. That is one of the genetic mechanisms that have been identified. Um, If a mom has a a more um, sensitive inflammatory response, baby might have inherited it. Or if dad did and, you know, and and mom gets sick, the baby might have a more pronounced inflammatory response that can impact their brain. And after a baby is born, say they, um, they have documented via ultrasounds over time, um, that after a baby experiences a pneumonia or sepsis, there could be an extension of a prior periventricular hemorrhage, for mm. example. So repeat insults during the NICU time can contribute, can continue to contribute to more damage um, as a baby grows and develops. Mary, how, how often can, can you look back and kind of pinpoint, ah, this is probably what caused the CP versus times when it's, we have no idea really how it came to pass. That is a really excellent question. Um, Over uh, the years that I've been doing this, we've had a couple of cases. I'll give you two case examples, a little baby who was born full term, but, um, has severe respiratory distress at birth um, because the PDA closed or something. And they, so they really have persistent fetal circulation is the old word. And they're really, really, really sick. I mean, they're on a ventilator for two weeks and they're hundred percent oxygen for a couple of weeks. Um, And then I see them six months later and they have signs of CP. Well, I wasn't really surprised, but we get a CT scan and the the child has lysencephaly. Which is? Uh, means that the brain developed abnormally. The, the, the brain does not have the normal sulci and gyrel pattern. It's mostly smooth. Oh, instead of the deep furrows. Right. Yeah. So no furrows, just a smooth brain. So that was the cause of the CP. And retrospectively, maybe that abnormal brain caused his difficulty with respirations at birth. Oh, so it wasn't the respiratory problem that caused the brain injury. It's the brain that it was a developmental problem. From conception. Yes, yes. And then uh, very recently, I have a patient who is 17 years old um, who was a 26-weeker, 
had signs of CP. Um, I don't even remember what the MRI or CT scan showed, but he recently had a neurologic change and a neurologist went back and looked at the original MRI and said it was normal and he probably doesn't have CP. He has something else. <laughs> wow. That's good news. But I'm still waiting to see what this is because he's classic CP with uh, with all of the signs of CP. Wow. But So we're learning. We're still learning. 10% of the time, but a child has clear-cut CP, the MRI is normal. Wow. Good news. Now, we, so, yeah, so, Mary, what is it that usually brings CP to a parent's attention or to your attention? How is it um, found? How is it found early? The early is if parents notice a difference in how they move um, or how they um, react. Now, especially if they've had other children. Now, parents will often be the first time to notice that one arm is stiffer than the other, or one leg is stiffer than the other. Hemiplegic CP typically happens as a result of a prenatal stroke, but it is often, most often, not noticed in the nursery. You know how little babies, when they're born, they're like this anyways. Right. With their <laughs> arms gravity, brought up. Yeah. yeah. Is that so like a gravity. classic position of somebody with CP to have one arm uh, bent at the elbow and held closer to their body and another arm at their side? For hemiplegic, that would be very common, yes. For hemiplegic cerebral palsy. How Typically common would you see somebody with, with both of them clenched, both arms clenched, less commonly than one? Less commonly, less commonly because uh, both clenched is a more severe form of cerebral palsy. It's quadriplegic. I mean, it's more severe. And if it's hemiplegic, are, do they kind of have either a foot drop or a foot drag along with that one clenched arm? Usually a, a foot drag because, again, there's high tone in the leg. Um, and usually it's with the leg in extension and the, and the foot pointing downward. So they end up dragging. Okay. So the knee doesn't bend as easily. The knee doesn't bend and the ankle, the ankle, the doesn't. ankle is pushing down. Got it. That's typical hemiplegic, a lot like an adult stroke. What What would be the range of the normal time to diagnose a patient with CP? Kind of the earliest and maybe the, the latest that people would be diagnosed. Well, there are um, new, new, new ways of making a diagnosis of CP much earlier than we used to. I'm going to say up to even five years ago, Doctors would be reluctant to make a diagnosis of cerebral palsy until after the age of two. Uh -huh. But now we most well, most often will diagnose it much earlier. And it's even possible to make a preliminary diagnosis in the neonatal intensive care unit. Wow. And it's based on skilled observation of the types of movements that a baby shows. Um, there's a particular kind of movement called a cramped synchronous movement that is absolutely characteristic of CP. It is better predictive of CP than an MRI or an wow. ultrasound of the brain. Wow. So what's a cramp synchronous movement, Mary? Well, I'll try to show it. <laughs> it's something like this. It the arms or the legs, it could be the whole body. But ordinarily when a, a healthy baby will have continuous movements going on all the time and you can't predict where they're going to be. But a cramped synchronous movement is there's a contraction of a whole limb into a, a stiff pattern. For example, it could be the arms, could be the legs, could be their trunk. Both at the same time or could it be just one limb at a time? Could be just one limb at a time. Yep. One limb so like, or two limbs. So straightening the arm or straightening the leg and pulling it back? Yes. Yes. Pushing it out for a couple of seconds. That's okay. not normal. Not, uh -huh. not a simple stretch. Not a simple stretch that a baby might do. Um, so it, it takes it takes some skill to learn how to differentiate these different types of movements. But a person who's um, been trained can identify those movements even in the nursery. And there are more subtle signs as well. More commonly now, a diagnosis can be made under age one by using a Hammersmith neurologic examination. The name mm. Hammersmith comes from a pediatric hospital in England, but there's a very distinct, um, carefully documented 
neurologic exam just for children, starting with the cranial nerves, but looking at muscle tone, looking at muscle posture, looking at movement, looking at um, reflexes, um, looking at responses to movement. Um, you can, if I re remember correctly, the maximum score, you can get 75. That's um, a lot of points. Yeah. <laughs> That's under, a lot to score. Under, yeah. yeah, it is. It, it takes a, a good 15 or 20 minutes to do it. Um, but based on that number, we are able to predict whether or not the child has CP and the severity by about nine months of age. Wow. And, and that is, so, that's a really new thing. So what are the main ways that a child with this suffers? What is their main struggle physically with CP? It is motor control of whatever limbs or body parts are affected. Now, if, if it's diplegia and it, so it's just mostly their legs, they'll walk funny and those they might be the kids who could be mocked as being spastic, although a doctor would use that word spastic just to describe the gait. Yes. Um, similarly, a child with hemiplegia will have an unusual gait. The one arm will be bent, the other leg may not move as smoothly. Um, that's how it would be be recognized. I'm sorry. I think I lost my que I lost your question. I'm no, so you got sorry. it. What were the key physical struggles okay. of kids? Now, some of these kids have behave behavioral struggles too, don't they? Right. Interestingly, there's a higher risk of autism amongst children with cerebral palsy. And why? Um, why would that be? If this is a motor condition, it must be more than motor. Yeah, it is more than motor. There's a whenever a child has an insult that affects that motor strip of the brain, whatever caused that injury to the motor strip of the brain can cause abnormalities or injury to other parts of the brain. And and the mo, one of the most commonly injured parts of the brain in infants who have cerebral palsy is that parietal cortex. When I went to medical school, we called it the silent cortex. Yeah. Now we call it the association cortex. We didn't know 40 years ago that I didn't know what, the, what it did. Oh, wow. Now we Is call it, it the association cortex, right? So the parietal, um, it, that would be kind of the top of the head from the ears backward to where a guy would never lose his hair. That The, the back half of the bald area of a bald man, right? No, actually, it's both sides. It's a, right behind the ear going up. Right. That's what it's I mean. So, yep. yeah. so the top of the head above the occipital fringe. So if a guy goes bald, really bald, but still has that fringe, it's right above that toward the, to the top of the head from the sides to the top. Right. It, from the ears up as well as back there. Yes. Yeah. And that, that part of the brain is particularly vulnerable to infarction and loss of brain mass. So in stroke in, infarction for our listeners. Yes. yes. Yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, oh, that's okay. Just just trying to make it easier for all of us to understand. And on that note, we're going to take a break here and come back with more of Cerebral Palsy here on Dr. Doctor after the break. And we are back with Dr. Doctor today talking about Cerebral Palsy. Mary, I, I wondered if you could describe a little bit more some of the behavioral challenges. Is that something that would be expected for all kids with CP or, or the majority of them? And, and what does that look like? No, I would say that behavioral challenges are relatively rare. Um, there are youngsters, I'm going to say 5 to 10% may have um, autism. Um, up to 40 to 50% can have a learning problem, learning disability, um, and a percentage of those will actually have intellectual disability. Um, because and I guess the, that's the, those are the key numbers, I guess. So uh, most of them do not have substantial behavior problems unless there's something else going on. Very good. And so the muscle problems. Are those fixed? Can they ever get better? Because when we think about strokes in adults, if we equate this to being similar to having strokes in babies or young children, we typically don't think of stroke patients getting better with their muscle and movement problems. How about the kids with CP? The earlier we identify them, the earlier we can initiate intervention and the more optimistic we can be 
about improvements in their motor skills. And I should take a step backwards, actually. Um, one of the new treatments, although asphyxia is a less than 10 percent, uh, the cause of less than 10 percent of kids with CP, brain cooling has mm. made a tremendous difference in the outcome, even for youngsters who have very severe asphyxia. So asphyxia being a lack of oxygen. And, and how much Correct. lack, what kind of lack of oxygen are we talking, Mary, in those cases? What's happened? How long have they been without? They could be several minutes. Ouch. They can be several minutes with a pH, even a pH of 6.9. And a normal pH is what? 7.4. Yeah, so that's so, quite acidic. That's a huge difference. It's, it's a huge difference. So that's a long time without oxygen and accumulation of, of carbon dioxide. And so these would be babies who, that, after they, they, are, they are without oxygen and that's identified right after birth, then they'd be put on a cooling blanket. Is that right? No, there are actually devices for brain cooling. Tell us about that. Oh, they, they're, um, I do not have a picture or anything to show you. I, I don't have. But is it like a helmet? You. Is it? It's like a helmet. It's like a helmet and it cools the brain and they usually do it for about three days. And by cooling the brain, they reduce the energy requirements of nerve cells while they're trying to recover from this insult. So do wow. they have it in the shape of like you're in Chicago, Chicago bear helmets or Green Bay Packer helmets? Probably not your hospital. <laughs> yeah, we don't have them. We don't have them in the rehab hospital. They're they're in part of, of NICU, neonatal intensive care unit treatments. So. Oh, very good. That's amazing. How how much how many degrees colder do they make the brain? I don't remember. I'm sorry. I don't remember. Mary, what, what other treatments are available for kids who are identified, as you had mentioned later, maybe a few years old even? When, when a patient's identified, what happens to them? What do you recommend? Well, we uh, first of all, make the diagnosis in a gentle way as much as we can. And usually when it's that late, parents are relieved to hear that there's an explanation. Mm. Um, do they tend to blame it, themselves? It, it, not in my experience. Oh, generally good. not. In my experience, generally not. Now, a newborn baby, it may be more often that they'll blame themselves. But when I'm seeing a child who's 12 or 13, oh. they, they're just relieved to hear what, what it is, to have an explanation. Um, it's harder for children who spend time in NICU. Um, not that the parents are to blame, but uh, parents... In my experience, very often feel horrible guilt about. And, and that's what I was thinking of. I mean, how, isn't it uncommon to make a diagnosis after the age of 10 or after the age of five? I mean, weren't the yeah. signs there already, or can the signs appear that late? No, the signs are there, but they're not always recognized. And again, CP is two to three per thousand. Yes. So there are a lot of doctors who really haven't seen very much of it. And if Very you good. think about when, it, I, when I went to the pediatrician's office, I mean, we sat up on a plinth and they listened to our heart and our lungs. They checked our ears. They checked our eyes. I don't think they ever watched me walk or run. Good point. Yeah. So no, and you Nobody's them, doing the 75-point neuro exam on, on little babies. That's for sure. That, that's not, for not sure. That's for sure. So um, it's missed not out. It, it, it's missed honestly. Um and I don't think anybody is negligent, um, but it's not something that a lot of doctors see very much of. So, Mary, when when a go 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 when ahead a, when a patient's first diagnosed, what what beyond the diagnosis do we recommend to try and improve their outcome? Okay, identifying all of the associated issues. A child who has CP is more likely to have a vision problem, for example, cortical vision impairment. Mm -hmm. The more severe the CP, the more likely they are to have a cortical vision impairment. They may also have ROP. They also may have retinopathy prematurity. But even if the retinopathy prematurity goes away, they're going to have vision issues because of their brain issues. Uh -huh. More vision issues in kids with CP are brain-related than they are eyeball-related. Uh -huh. Very good. We see with our brains, 
<laughs> our eye is just a conduit to get the information to our brains. And again, if the processing part of the brain has been affected, they're likely to get, um, the, all the 40% of our brain has to do with vision, oh, our wow. optic, our, our optic chiasm and our optic radiations, our occipital cortex. And then you look at the brainstem, all of the, um, nuclei for muscle control, 40% of the brain or more has to do with vision. So what, what, what is the role for like physical therapy and stuff okay. in, in treatment for CP? We try to get physical therapy initiated right away because we want to prevent those long-term muscle issues. We want to prevent contractures. We want to maintain range of motion. We want to promote more normal patterns. We want to um, help them to walk as normally as possible. And if we can identify tone problems early, like if they're a month old, we get CP, possible CP in a one month old, if we get a pediatric therapist who knows what she's doing, she can inhibit some of the abnormal movements, teach family how to position a child better, help keep the muscles flexible, help develop, pre prevent development of contractures, um, teach mom and other caregivers how to do the same thing. Um, so I, I, there's a lot of hope if we can begin intervention early. So even though there's a... a a fixed problem in the brain with control of muscles, you can still learn skills to kind of bypass some of those and have a smoother movement possible and more yes, normal it is tone. To learn. And let, let's talk a little bit about that because that's what's Please. very exciting. Yes. Um, how do we learn? We keep learning, even though we, you and I, the three of us, yes. aren't making very many new nerve cells anymore. We're making For some, but we're not making very many. More but synapses, learning, right? more connections. Yeah, yeah, synapses. Every time a nerve cell fires, it turns on the genetic machinery to make more synapses, to make more axons. To make more connections to so other nerves. To make more connections. So if a child is practicing these cramp synchronous movements over and over and over again, that part of the brain yes. is repeating the same abnormal movements. On the other hand, if we're not allowing that to happen, if we're keeping the muscles flexible and, and doing other things other than that cramp synchronous movements, we're making more normal connections. So we are trying to teach the brain more normal movements. We're trying to prevent the brain from making lots of um, abnormal connections. And that's why there's so much hope. So if we're we taking advantage of what's called plasticity, right? Exactly. Exactly. You hit it. And plasticity goes on till we're much older. That's not just a thing with the brain and kids. That's right. Stroke patients can show substantial improvement over time with a treatment that we actually also use in children. Um, and it has a couple of names. One, it's forced use or constraint-induced therapy. Um, for adults with strokes, if you put their well-functioning arm in a cast, so that they have to use their hemiparetic ah. arm, you get get better connections with that hemiparetic arm. And the same thing with children. It's probably better with children, easier with children, because they've got more. Same thing with lazy form. eye or strabismus. You cover exactly. the good eye. Okay. Exactly. Very good. You, you promote I, I always exercise. think of the, the shorthand version of, of many types of physical therapy as you, you figure out where it hurts and then you make them do that or you figure out what they can't do and, and you, you make them do that. I don't know if that's just a family medicine understanding of it, but it, it seems like you just lean into those limits and then all of a sudden you surpass them. Well, that you know. might be what happens with adults more often than kids. Pediatric therapists have to be very bright, very um, creative. How, how do to you get, get kids to co cooperate with that? They make therapy play. It has mm. to be play. Um, and that's why you, you can't really, in most cases, a, a geriatric therapist cannot take care of kids because they don't understand sure. how, how to get a child to cooperate and things that they might not want to do. Now, shows Mary the importance of getting a good therapist. <laughs> yes. Amen. A good therapist doesn't, they, if a good therapist, the child doesn't know they're working. Oh, that's a they're, great way to evaluate playing. that. 
So, Mary, yeah. in prepping for this show, you mentioned that there are sometimes communication problems with CP patients. What are they and how are they best overcome? Um, one of the most difficult challenges of children and families who have more severe CP is that the muscles of speech ah. and breathing can be affected. Mm. We who are fortunate enough to have a, a normal tongue and mouth and pharynx don't realize that it's the most complicated thing that we ever do, Speaking. producing speech, because we have to use many tiny muscles in very rapid succession in, in different combinations every millisecond. Um, at the same time that we have to be coordinating our breathing um, to produce sound, et cetera. So it's by far the most complicated motor skill we have. And even uh, many children who have f very severe cerebral palsy are trapped in a body. They want to communicate. They are smart, but they can't. Now, there was a, a movie produced about 25 years ago called My Left Foot. My Left Foot. It's a very good movie um, that explores that just a little bit. Um, but if, uh, if you can imagine being locked in, that's what almost some of these kids are like. You know, locked they in. Want you to know what's in. going on, but you can't communicate. You can understand, you can receive, but not... Oh my gosh. Not so what, what are some of the improvements that have happened in this arena, Mary? Well, we've got some wonderful computer pro computer um, programs that use eye movement to move a cursor along um, to spell words or and word prediction now. We've got word prediction computers that make <laughs> things a lot easier. Now the problem can get you into a pickle too sometimes. Yes, I yes, they mean that. They didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to um, take that out of my my options. I don't use that word. <laughs> but also think about where kids when they're taking a bath, they can't put a computer in the or if they're no. on the beach. You know, the, yeah. there are so many uh, so many places that it's unrealistic to have uh, an eye gaze computer system to communicate. Um, there is a, a new system called P-O-D-D, -D, POD, that's been around about 15 years that is a low-tech option that really gives children um, and adults um, much more freedom and ability to communicate their ideas, their desires, um, their concerns. So what does that look like? Uh, I, I've got one here. Let me show you. This is a pod book. Okay, and so it's on a. a uh, <laughs> oh, so I see. So you have a uh, something that goes around your neck that's holding this these flip charts. Yep, it's flip chart, and they're in a very specific way. This is a pod book for a child who has cortical vision impairment. So there's twelve colorful yeah. pictures on on one page that she's sewing for our yeah. our radio audience. So this helps them to communicate and point to things that they they want other people to understand. Right, or or more often their parent or somebody initially, because some of the children they can't move their arms at all. They can't talk either. Wow. So the the book it's almost a different language. Yes. Um, but I've gone to courses using the computers and I've gone to courses using this book and the book is a whole lot easier for me. <laughs> sure. Than some of the computer systems. And may, may, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> there we go. I'm sorry about that. May so you, that's, that's an example of a pod book. I've oh got no, a, there. Thanks for sharing that. You had mentioned also that the COVID pandemic has led to some interesting uh, benefits for some of your patients. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I've I have uh, patients with severe cerebral palsy who I had assumed to be severely intellectually disabled as well, and with COVID they couldn't go to school. Uh, mom couldn't go to work, so mom ended up being the child's aide as the child participated in virtual school over the internet. And mom was good with pod. Ah. 
So the the child was able to demonstrate to the teachers what he knew. Wow. Oh. They had made the same unfair assumption that I had made. He's now in regular classes. Oh my goodness. Wow. He was in a self-contained classroom, presumed to be severely impaired, and now he's he's not in only uh, um full classes, but he's in at least part-time in regular classrooms because he, and he participates. He participates. Oh, that's a beautiful story. Oh, and and I've had a couple of patients, the very same thing happened. So so how will this impact what you do differently coming out of the pandemic? I'm going to be a more vigorous proponent for communication systems. And um, I'm starting even earlier. I have children who with, I now know when they're one year old, how bad their CP is likely. So I start talking about pod then. So in our last couple minutes here, what would you recommend for parents who either have a child with CP or think they might? What are the best resources um, that they could go to? What should they do? Um, they, I would encourage them to get a, a clear diagnosis with a pediatric neurologist or a pediatric physiatrist or a neurodevelopmental pediatrician, all of whom are experts in cerebral palsy and can make the diagnosis. I think all of those, any of those specialty groups would, at this point in time, uh, know the Hammersmith exam um, and and be able to make the diagnosis and recommend appropriate treatment. Um, Yes, we work on motor skills, but we also very importantly, must identify if there's vision loss or hearing loss or other learn factors that might adversely affect their learning. They are medications that can help reduce the muscle stiffness and spasticity. And then there is therapy, occupational therapy to address use of the arms and self-care activities and physical therapy for mobility um, and strengthening of, uh, for standing and, and sitting um, and moving. Um, speech therapy, if there's any trouble swallowing, you know they're going to have trouble as well with speaking. They need to get in with a speech pathologist very early, not waiting until they're two, Mary, which is often the case. This is great advice. This has been practical and fun. Thanks for being with us on what is one of our first video episodes of Dr. Doctor. You're going to have to listen to the end of the show because now you can even see what Mary was showing us. Thanks and God bless you, Mary. Thank you. And we are back with Dr. Doctor and we have at this time of the show, the answer to the trivia question. Yes, um, category- good us. yes, it was muscle contraction. And the question was, what chemical element is necessary so that the two types of filaments, tiny fibers and muscles called actin and myosin, can actually connect to each other and pull each other, you know, along the way? And, you know, not only necessary for strong bones and teeth, but also for good muscles, and it's calcium. So calcium is necessary. And surprisingly, and it's a complex reason why, I won't go into it, but low calcium actually can lead to spasms uh, with when muscles are tight and can't release. So an appropriate level of calcium is necessary for normal muscle function. There you have it. Andrew, three top takeaways from this episode for you. Yeah, I, w- I was so happy to talk to Mary. I, I appreciate her coming on and kind of giving us the rundown of CP. I guess the the number one thing would be that there is a spectrum of conditions that are all CP, but they might all look very different. And Mary went through a lot of different potential causes and what, what those look like. I'd say number two, the, the most important takeaway point maybe even would be that early intervention can lead to improvements and really an increase in potential even for the patient taking advantage of that plasticity while the brain is still adding more neurons and not just more connections. So the earlier, the better. And and I'd say that the third takeaway was something Mary was kind of hitting on at the end there is just how hopeful some of these new therapies are. She mentioned the communication boards and even the fancy computers you can move with your eyes and, and communicate in that way, that 
so many conditions that we hear about and are, are treated. It's kind of the old, you know, the old humdrum. And I think many patients might feel like, well, the people always uh, have been treating this the same way. That's not the case for cerebral palsy. There are many new opportunities. The earlier, the better. And if, if parents are concerned, I'd go ahead and approach your, your family doctor or pediatrician, try and seek out those specialists, get a diagnosis, and that way you can get help sooner than later. Yeah, I, I like the fact that she brought up that the brain can rewire itself. Um, in, in other words, it's something Kevin Majors in other episodes has taught us, is that the brain learns faster than any other organ based on our behavior. So if your behavior is making new connections, uh, it can last. So that to me is really hopeful in a condition I always thought there was no hope for it to get better. I thought it could you could only maintain or go downhill, but that is not the case. Well, and I, I think as an analogy, maybe some of our listeners are more familiar with is after maybe a, a knee replacement or something that's quite common like that, I can tell you, I see such a difference with the people who go to therapy and really work oh. super hard and the people who don't and the outcomes are totally different. And really, I, I think that's something that we can learn a lesson for the pediatric diseases as well. More intervention, the earlier, the better. Well, it's time for our sign-off when you're going to learn about our new video viewing option. But thank you for listening to another episode of Dr. Doctor, the award-winning radio program and podcast hosted by physicians of the Catholic Medical Association. Please share the good news of Dr. Doctor with a friend and invite them to listen on their favorite podcast app. And so you can find all of our old episodes on our website, drdoctor.org. But now we also have video cast of our podcast that we're rolling out uh, that will link to the YouTube channel. Please go ahead to drdoctor.org and check out our videos. For those who also want to dive deeper into some of the topics, check our website for bonus links and information in our post for each episode. Just click latest at the top of the main page. This is Dr. Tom McGovern. And Dr. Andrew Mullally, and we're signing off until your next dose of Dr. Doctor.